As of this video's writing in January 2022, the world watches the tiny island of Taiwan off the coast of China. As we collectively hold our breath, we ask the question of if the unimaginable is possible. Could the US and China have a war? This is a video to analyze how likely a war between the two is, what could start it, and how worried we should be. This video is meant to look inside the war rooms of what both the US and Chinese government are thinking, seeing their trade-offs and tensions over a possible war. Conflicts define world history and war captures all of our imaginations. With Conflict of Nations, you can experience war and define history, right from your computer or phone. Conflict of Nations is an online real-time strategy game that lets you play as a nation in the modern world and vie for domination against up to 128 opponents. The game's intense with wars that can last weeks. It's super fun and engaging, and I love the challenge of trying to lead a country into a war for supremacy. It has an incredible combat system with complex and amazing battles that have over a hundred beautifully modeled modern fighting units such as nuclear ballistic submarines, airborne infantry, stealth strike fighters, and more. If that's not enough for you, you can escalate with weapons of mass destruction. There's a complex diplomacy system as well where you can backstab and form alliances with real people. So in total, if you're into warfare, strategy games, or world domination, this is a game for you. Right now, Conflict of Nations is offering anyone using the link below 13,000 gold and a one-month free premium subscription. The offer is only available for 30 days, so don't lose time. Join the fight on Conflict of Nations. The Chinese stand astride the era of the fastest economic growth in all of history. They went from being a poverty-stricken nation 40 years ago, economically on par with a lot of African countries, to by some measurements being the largest economy in the world. Due to this meteoric rise, China's bursting with energy and confidence right now. China's rise has been so fast that it hasn't caught up politically, and the Chinese don't even control their own neighborhood. Let's briefly compare it to America, which is surrounded on both sides by oceans, and basically has its entire hemisphere as some degree of satellite, with a couple notable exceptions. China is bordered by Vietnam and India that despise it, and our American allies, alongside Russia to the north that's a completely untrustworthy ally. Even its allies like North Korea, Kazakhstan, and Burma are unstable, and don't even like the Chinese that much. When you look at China's actions, you can see the result of this geographic insecurity, in that America could hypothetically sail right up to the Chinese coastline, but at the same time, the historic insecurity that comes from China's century of humiliation. Under the Qing Dynasty 200 years ago, China believed itself to be the greatest nation in the world, but from 1840 to 1945, China faced defeat and humiliation at the hands of Western powers in Japan, with death tolls around 150 million, if you count disease and famine. It's impossible to understand the Taiwan situation from a non-Chinese perspective. The Chinese feel the need to regain the honor they lost from the century of humiliations by pushing for symbolic victories like Taiwan or the Spratlys, which in of themselves don't matter a tremendous amount on the international stage. Something that's also really key is the symbolic importance Taiwan has is that it's run by the old Chinese Nationalist Party, which the Chinese Communist Party gained power from in the Civil War 80 years ago. The Communist and Nationalist Party sort of justify their existence in opposition to the other. Thus, it's also considered important to the Communist Party's honor that Taiwan is seized. At the same time, Taiwan's a model for another trajectory of Chinese civilization, one that's democratic and richer than the Communist, which is a threat to the Chinese Communist Party's legitimacy. China's more afraid of Taiwan as a symbol to people in China to rally against their rule than the tiny island that it really is. When Westerners look at China, we tend to see its strength, and that's largely what the Communist Party wants us to see, but we don't see its weaknesses, a situation I go into depth in this video, the link to which is in the description. We don't see China's horrible demographic structure, for example, how their birth rate's a quarter of what it should be, and they'll have half their population in 80 year time. Alternatively, their immense class, systemic, and resource problems. China, like most newly industrialized nations, is burning with energy, but it's also exhausted from the social pain that comes from industrialization. It's no coincidence that the U.S. fought a civil war during its industrialization. Europe was wrecked a generation after industrialization, with world wars and Japan in the same camp. The Chinese Communist Party stayed in power for so much longer than other international communist parties by implicitly buying support from the Chinese people with economic growth. 
As China becomes a more mature economy, and it also gets involved in trade wars, it slows its economic growth. And as I talk about in this video, the government pushes for both nationalism and oppressive authoritarian measures as a way to keep control over its own population. When China pushes for Taiwan, it's not doing it out of either strength or weakness, but almost like a drug-induced burst of confidence that comes from a profound insecurity over its position. The parallels of World War I are horrifying. There's this thing called Thucydides' Trap, which is basically that a dominant power is incentivized to try to crush a rising power before said rising power is strong enough to overtake the dominant one. There was a study that found there were 15 examples of this over the last 500 years, and that 12 of them resulted in war. From this logic, the U.S. should fight a war with China before China is capable of overtaking America. For decades, the U.S. and China worked together since they could make a lot of money from trading with each other. The U.S. ignored China's rise to great power as well as American industry's relocation there. However, starting a little bit with Obama and really ramping up with Trump, the United States started to see China more as a rival. This was driven partially by the social unrest that came from America due to deindustrialization, but also by China's greater geopolitical predominance and aggression. Thus, with America's changed views on China, it's been making more pro-Taiwanese stances. Although Taiwan in real terms has been an American ally since the beginning, the U.S. has recognized Communist China as the real China in official documents in a weird dance. Starting with Trump, the U.S. has been breaking diplomatic taboos, like the U.S. president taking direct phone calls from the Taiwanese one. For the Chinese coming from a shame-based culture, this is an attack upon their honor as a nation. The U.S. sees a China that's spreading its influence and that scares America, which forces the U.S.'s hand in a lot of ways. The U.S. maintains an alliance structure that includes Taiwan, but also the whole Pacific perimeter around China, including Indonesia, Vietnam, the Philippines, South Korea, and Japan. The problem with alliance structures is that they're maintained more by pride than by military force. Thus, if the U.S. let China take Taiwan without a fight, that would precipitate a crisis in America as the world's policeman, which might result in a collapse of the already weak U.S. dollar, or U.S. allies leaving the American alliance structure possibly going to China, which might look to be a more stable ally and the power of the future. If I was part of the American leadership, I would try to isolate China, gradually strangling it rather than being direct. But a major problem of all American international policy across its history is that it often lacks subtlety and gradation. Americans are always either in or out. The U.S. would probably do something big and brash just out of its own nature. Also, like China and frankly everywhere else in the world, America is torn by its own class, political, and systemic issues that make effective political action more difficult. America is not united at home and disorganized, which means that its actions abroad will be more foolish and ineffective. The question I'm going to ask here is what factors normally create wars across history, and what's different about the U.S. and China's struggle from the norm? I normally find it annoying when people say wars won't happen anymore. This is since that argument's been used so many times before in history, and it was wrong every single time. People thought that global trade made wars unprofitable, which is the argument people use today and before World War I. However, there is one point that has to be taken very seriously, which is nuclear weapons. The United States and Russia both have over 6,000 nukes, which means they could end modern civilization as we know it. This is the biggest reason why the Cold War never became a real war, in that nuclear weapons act as a deterrent against full-scale industrial war. However, the complication here is that China only has 300 nukes, most of which are in regional missiles and so can't even hit North America. That means that the U.S. has over 60 times as many nukes, which makes it look like the U.S. has overwhelming superiority. However, the U.S., due to being a nation with at least a little bit of moral consciousness, is unwilling to wipe the nation of China off the face of the earth if they don't nuke America first. Both the U.S. and China have signed treaties saying they won't use nuclear weapons, and that actually plays into China's self-interest, since they have a larger population industrial base, which would serve them better in a conventional war. However, even if the U.S. and China decide not to use nukes, nukes are still on the table. The idea that the human race and hundreds of millions of lives could be at stake could make the situation more tense just to say the least. If China were to invade Taiwan, the U.S. might not intervene just due to fear of the possibility of nuclear weapons being used. So nukes might prevent a war, but they also might not. Thus, industrial wars only break out when one society views the survival of their society at risk. The American Civil War happened when the South knew that if things kept going the way they were, the industrializing North would abolish slavery democratically. 
World War I broke out when the British and French knew that if things kept going the way they were, that the Germans would dominate them, and the Germans had the same anxiety about the Russians. Both Japan and Germany's economies would have imploded if they didn't start World War II, thus probably removing their regimes from power. The brilliant historian David Hackett Fisher found that you can predict collapses in world systems with pretty easy regularity. I made a video about it here, but we can basically check out all the boxes pretty easily. High inflation and inequality, rising cost of living and declining standard of living, all of which cause international tension and civil wars. We basically know there's going to be a lot of wars in the next couple decades, but the question is whether the big worst case scenario of a full US-China war happens. The problem here is that the world system at this point, and you see this in both the US and China, is that both countries are crushed by their own internal problems, and so they try to tilt the world system to favor them, either by creating tariffs or shutting off immigration for America or gaining political power for China. However, when everyone needs concessions from the international system to keep their countries functioning, the world system just dies. The previous world crises that have happened have combined both internal and external wars. An example of this is how France fought the Thirty Years' War and then collapsed into civil war. Or, in the 18th century, France had their own revolution and then fought the Napoleonic Wars. Russia fought World War I, then collapsed into civil war. I think given China's massive demographic problems, there's no way the Communist Party stays in power. If their population is supposed to have by the end of this century, that means they're going to have a remarkable social collapse. The problem here is the sheer amount of chaos in modern world system makes it very difficult to predict actual results. As an example, a conflict between Chinese and American allies in a place like the Middle East or Eastern Europe could spiral into a war involving the US and China. It's hard to say what the exact conditions would be in a US-China war or a Chinese invasion of Taiwan. So we're going to start here with the assumption that China does invade Taiwan. What would happen afterwards? Well, let's say that the Chinese fleet crosses the ocean to invade Taiwan. Most military projections in the U.S. would say that China would be able to conquer Taiwan relatively easy, and I'm assuming Chinese war games say roughly the same. A major problem is that we don't have the important classified details that the Chinese and American governments do on combat details. I know some of the weapon systems, but not how effective they are, for example. No major war was fought like people expected, since people calculate the importance of variables incorrectly. As an example, I've heard the Chinese have the ability to jam satellite signals off the coast of China that would destroy U.S. naval communications, and that their missile force is extremely impressive. However, I'm not sure how effective either of these are in the real world. It's also totally possible that the U.S. would be able to defeat the Chinese landing force given the U.S.'s much more powerful navy. Another factor is that amphibious invasions of well-defended coastlines are extremely difficult as a rule, especially with a nation as well-armed and defended as Taiwan. As another possibility, once the Chinese reach the beachheads, it's entirely unclear how effective the Chinese military really is. As a rule, Chinese organizations tend to be pretty binary in either being extremely competent and efficient or mired in corruption, largely determined by how honest the top leadership is. Alternatively, it's unclear how effective the Taiwanese military is, either given that I've heard some reports saying it's really good, and others saying they have an outdated and foolish military doctrine. The biggest and primary question we have is whether the U.S. would get involved to protect Taiwan. On one side, the Chinese attack on Taiwan is a direct attack on an American ally, and more abstractly the American world order, which might result in U.S. allies leaving America or the dollar world system. On the other hand, starting a world war that would kill at least tens of millions of people over a tiny island is an expensive decision. Although it's really a coin toss, I think under the current Biden administration, the U.S. is less likely to protect the island. I honestly think that the most likely option America would push for if China seizes Taiwan is that America blocks off trade to China and puts the country under trade embargoes. The U.S. Navy is extremely powerful and can do this easily, but the problem is that China is so dependent upon foreign trade, especially in fossil fuels from the Middle East, that it might launch into war to protect its economic survival. Some of you might be reminded of the U.S. embargo of Japan during World War II that practically forced the Japanese to declare war on America at Pearl Harbor. There are two ways of thinking about this, in that either the U.S. would pursue this policy while forgetting history, and another that the U.S. would cynically position China to start the war in order to make China look bad on the international stage and alienate its possible allies. Which brings up the question, would China push for another target after seizing Taiwan? If Taiwan was seized, it wouldn't solve any of China's internal problems, which might mean that they would need to go after something else. 
If returning to China's pre-century of humiliations is important as it is for many Chinese nationalists, then the annexation of Mongolia, or more importantly the very strategic Okinawa Islands off the south coast of Japan which have American military bases, might become new targets. However, to be honest, I think the Chinese pushing against America that directly is unlikely. I think saber rattling with India is more plausible. I think that if the US didn't start a war over Taiwan and engage China indirectly, that China would fall apart in the next few decades due to its own internal problems. I think the US could put the nail in the coffin by forming allies with Russia and promoting rebellions in Central Asia to fully surround and isolate China. However, a war with China would result in tens of millions of deaths, in a truly history-forming war. A war I've gone over in more detail in that video. What a faultist and thanks for watching. If you enjoyed that video, please like, comment, subscribe, or stay tuned for additional content. Or alternatively, check me out on Patreon where I've got the first couple hundred pages of my social history of America and cultural history of the world, or my social media. As always, thanks so much for watching and have a great day.